Good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for one of our ASSE talks and I'm delighted to be joined today by John Murray who is co-founder of the Highland Business Partnership and we wanted to talk about something that um, has got a bit of a bad reputation. Debt is a fairly ugly word. Sadly however it's a reality many people are facing after the last year through absolutely no fault of their own. But there are things you can do and people you can talk to. So that's why we wanted to arrange today's discussion. The pandemic, I don't need to tell you, has been a challenging time for everyone. For some of the most affected sectors, we can look forward to a hopefully busy period ahead as we welcome visitors back. However, business owners may not be looking ahead to the leaner winter months when revenues are much reduced and mounting debts have to be repaid. Highland Business Partnership and the ASSC believe that now is the time to plant a seed of thought, debt management and financial planning before it's too late for some. It's important that we all face up to the challenges ahead. Small businesses are currently being supported by, to some extent by grants, furlough payments for employees and government backed loans. But the financial support schemes are due to come to an end in the autumn. And with the onset of repayments for C-bills and BBLs, the risk of insolvencies increases. So I'd like to welcome John Murray, as I say, co-founder of the Highland Business Partnership. John has been involved in the food and drink sector now for over 30 years, initially running a fruit and veg shop business, sorry, and distribution business, and then moving on to own and operate 15 convenience stores throughout the Highlands. After selling the stores, John worked with Scot Scotland Food and Drink for two years, covering the Highlands and Islands growing their membership by 80% within 14 months, which is amazing. He is currently involved in the creation and development of the Highland Business Partnership and Highland Food and Drink Club. He is a man on a mission and has got enormous amounts of energy behind him. John, over to you. Thank you for that, very kind. Um, I know most of the most people watching will be thinking that man has never been in business for 30 years, but never mind. Um, no, thank, thank you and yes, as as you alluded to, uh, very passionate, very energetic about the Highlands and Islands and um, and the businesses and the wider community. And through speaking to Claire, who's on the call, um, uh, equally passionate and, and knowledgeable and, and involved as myself, um, we felt that this was the right thing to do. So through both of our, our networks, we thought, well, we'll hook up with yourself um, and, and the ASSC uh, to, to run this event. So the Highland Business Partnership, just to those that might not know, is just, it's a fledgling organization, um, Facebook group at the moment with a directory being built for Highland businesses, local Highland businesses. And at the moment, we've got 1,600 members within the group. It's been a very positive experience, very collaborative, uh, people doing business locally. Uh, we're aware of businesses that are that are in existence that we didn't know existed, um, and we look forward to uh, working with other organisations as we move ahead. That's all I've got to say. Thank you, and looking forward to the session myself. To be honest. Wonderful. Well, we're, first of all, we're joined by Margot McLennan and Alan Munro. If you'd like to just introduce yourselves and and who you work for, and then. Look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Hi, I'm Margot McLennan. My business is McLennan Corporate. We specialise in business rescue and insolvency services. I spent most of my career with a big four firm before setting up my own practice based in Ayrshire, but helping clients throughout the UK with tailored debt solutions. Alan? Uh, thanks very much, Margot. I'm Alan Mano. I um, work for uh, KPMG's restructuring team. I'm based in Aberdeen now, uh, but I was, you know, your accent might still give me away. I was uh, born and raised in, in Erdgai in Sutherland. Um, like Margot, we uh, specialise in, in helping businesses that have uh, come across some, some difficulties, and we, we also deal with formal insolvency as well. Okay, good afternoon. It's fantastic to have this platform and the opportunity to speak to you all today. It's great news that the restrictions are easing and there's excitement as many businesses plan to reopen. However, I've no doubt many of you will be very worried about the level of debt in your business after a year of lockdowns. 
There's a popular misconception that insolvency is all about winding up businesses. However, an insolvency practitioner's first priority is always to explore all the options available and to try and help rescue a distressed business. The earlier you seek advice, the more options there will be. We know that dealing with debt is stressful. The stigma attached to debt doesn't help. However, rather, rather than encouraging people to stay out of debt, what the stigma does is pre prevents them from seeking help. Ironically, there is no stigma with borrowing money. No one batters an eyelid at someone openly speaking about taking out loans or being in an overdraft. So why should people be afraid to seek help when they've got debt problems? Given the current climate, it may come as a surprise to many of you that the number of corporate insolvencies in Scotland in the last 12 months uh, was 512 compared to 1,064 in the previous 12 months. So that's a reduction of 52% year on year. Within the accommodation sector, the last year saw a reduction of 55% and within the food and beverage sector, a reduction of 38%. The number of business failures in the accommodation sector are actually relatively low and as restrictions continue to unwind, there are many reasons to be optimistic. We may see consumer spending increase, but companies need to be aware of overtrading. If they don't have the cash flow needed to cover the full cost of reopening, they need to plan for a sustainable reopening of their business. There is no doubt the government support has, has been and continues to be a lifeline for many, which has stemmed rather than stopped the flow of insolvencies that we would expect to see in this climate. The government's decision to extend a number of its temporary insolvency measures to the 30th of June provides a window for anyone whose finances have been affected by the pandemic to plan for the future and to explore how they can improve their situation. So if you're worried about the level of debt or the survival of your business, now's the time to swallow your pride and seek advice. The problem won't go away by simply ignoring it. If you do nothing, it's likely that an insolvency process will follow. And if you've continued to trade an insolvent business to the detriment of your creditors, you may find yourself personally liable for the debts or disqualified from acting in the management of a business for up to 15 years. So what are the warning signs that you should be looking out for? I thought I would try and high highlight some trigger points that you can perhaps relate to that to me are red flag alerts and definite signs that you should seek some professional advice. The first one is, is your, your business in danger of running out of cash? Most businesses are used to juggling their cash flow and decline is often slow, but these lockdowns, it means for many that income has totally dried up and it will take time to recover. Don't ignore sliding figures, be realistic, prepare 12 month financial forecasts and I would recommend keeping a 13 week rolling cash flow. If you need to cut costs, you want to do it early and cut them hard. By doing it now, it may buy you the time you need to trade out this difficulty. The second thing to be aware of is mounting HMRC debts. No one wants HMRC breathing down their necks. We understand the complexities of how HMRC work and can remove the pressure by preparing information and presenting it in the right way to negotiate time to pay arrangements. If you want to avoid the agent knocking at your door, be proactive and get it sorted now. The third one is being under pressure from other creditors. Having creditors is a normal routine element of running a business until your ability to pay them on time is compromised. If you're falling behind with payments for goods or services or being refused credit or robbing Peter to pay Paul without making a real dent in your debt, these are red flags that should not be ignored. The fourth one, if you're worried about meeting the salaries at the end of the month, no business can run without people. And if you're unable to meet your payroll obligations, that could escalate the problem in all sorts of devastating ways. Therefore, payroll must be a priority for you. The fifth one, can you still bank on your bank continuing to support, support you? The bank runs your bank account so it can see the bigger picture. When your bank starts refusing loans, wanting to reduce your overdraft or asking for personal guarantees, it means they're concerned about the health of your business and so should you be. Um, sixth one, if you're thinking about injecting emergency funding or giving a last chance personal guarantee to secure funding, I would say be very careful about draining your personal finances. Running a business does require a lot of personal investment, but if you're plundering your personal bank account or putting your family home at risk 
that's unsustainable. It's also a massive warning that you need to turn the tide. Seek professional advice early and make sure you explore all the options and understand the risk before taking these steps. If your business is no longer viable, perhaps now is the time to look at exit strategies, wind it up and start afresh. And those personal funds may be needed to get a new, a new business off the ground. I suppose the final point and perhaps the most important is if you're really struggling to deal with the stress and the pressure. Sleepless nights, anxiety and depression are all entirely natural reactions to a distressing situation, but it can't continue. Seeking so help to get you back on track may save your business. Talk to an IP early and replace that worry with uncertainty and a plan of action. What I would say is in order to foresee these issues, it is really important that you keep your books and records up to date, up, as up to date as possible, allowing yourself time to plan for any unexpected events. If you don't take time in the action to address mounting creditor pressure, it's likely that they'll take action and an insolvency process will eventually follow. If you recognise any of these issues, you really should reach out, out for help. Please don't wait until the pressure becomes unbearable. Pick up the phone, whether it's to Alan, myself or another IP, just make that call and don't let pride stand in your way. As, IP, as IPs, we deal with distressed situations every day. So there's no need to feel embarrassed by the numbers. You won't be judged and any conversations will be kept confidential. Most IPs will offer a free consultation and the initial meeting should educate you on the options available to you and allow you to make an informed decision on the way forward. You will remain in control. No one's going to do anything as a result of such a meeting that forces you into an insolvency process. I'll now hand you over to Alan, who's going to run through those options. Thank you for listening, Alan. Thank you, Margo, and uh, thank you to the, the guys for, for having me along and for, for everyone uh, for joining. I, I see a couple at least of uh, familiar names on the on the guest list there. Um, as as Margo says, I mean, in answer to the question, when's a good time to go and speak to somebody about your business? It, it's really as early as possible because the options that you, you have available uh, I, the earlier you speak to someone, the more options will be available. Whereas the longer a business continues to trade, uh, particularly when it's unprofitable and loss making, the, the options available uh, will will reduce as, as some options are no longer possible um, the further a business goes down the road. Um, and that's in, in terms of what options you want to look at and um, where the likes of myself or Margo would, would potentially suggest to a business will really depend on what the position of the business is and what the, 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 the key stakeholders, which in most of the businesses we're dealing with in the, the SME uh, small medium enterprise market uh, will be the, the shareholders and the, the owners of the business. Uh, It'll, it will really depend on a. What does your trading look like? Can, is the business trading profitably at the moment? Has it ever traded profitably? And can it can it with changes be made to trade profitably? And b. What is the overall asset position of the business? So are is there a, a surplus of assets, but a lack of cash within the business? So the business could have access to properties and plant and equipment but no funds available to pay its creditors on a day-by-day -day basis or it could be that the business has um trades trades okay and can pay its creditors as they fall due on a day-by-day -day basis but overall has has too much debt either through bank or hmrc or other creditors that ultimately if, if everything were to be sold, there would be nothing left for the owners. And, and those two factors will, will largely influence what management might want to, to do and, and what options are available for a business. So if the business is, um, uh, has been successful previously, that is now uh, the trading is, is deteriorated. It might be that changes within the trading structure and some of the things that are done could return the business to, to profitability. Or as one of the, the points Margot touched on, if, if it might be that there's so 
the, 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 there's so much debt within the business that a, a restart or some kind of debt restructure is needed where the business can trade profitably, but has no real prospect of being able to, to pay off its creditors in full without some kind of debt compromise arrangement. So it will really depend on what the position of the business is, what the, the owners um, kind of view on, on what they want to achieve with the business. Do the owners have more money to put in? Should they put it in? Would, would they want to put it in? Um, is there other bank or other debt funding that can be arranged? Even uh, investment from, from other investors. I mean, there, there's, although um, it, it's, um, it, it's not always what owners want to achieve, it can be helpful to go and find other people to invest in the business who have either got cash that can help the business to succeed or expertise that can help in the business as trading. So that's something that I would always um, suggest is, is worth looking at as well, but it will really depend on the, the individual person's circumstances and what they want to achieve and, and whether, whether or not they want to continue with the business. We, we talk there about avoiding insolvency, but it's, and yes, it, the, the, there are instances I think where early enough a, a good discussion with a business can help for a, insolvency to be avoided, but there will also be some businesses, unfortunately, um, who who that, that just don't that don't trade profitably and, and can't trade profitably and there, there always will be an element of of insolvencies in in the economy at any given time and it's just trying to if a business is in that situation to try and deal with it as as best as possible because it's often not always the 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 owners that are involved you've got the employees and other creditors and the like and nobody wants to see a business continue where where it's not in the best interests of the, the people who are involved. So as I say, kind of headline takeaway, if you've got any doubts at all, if you've got any concerns about your business continuing, if you're under pressure from your creditors or trading isn't as you like, go and speak to speak to your advisor or speak to your bank or your accountant or your uh, or insolvency people like like myself and Margo. Don't don't sit in silence and, and stress alone. Thank you, Alan. Do you know, it's really actually, it's interesting to hear that insolvencies are down by 52%. Do you think that's because of the grants and the bounce back loans and things at the moment? Are we all sort of relying on the support that we've been given? I think it's twofold, Fiona. It's partly the support, but it's partly the other insolvency measures that have been in place and the restrictions on winding up orders. And, you know, the landlords um, not being able to evict tenants at the moment as well. Of course, of course. Well, thank you both very much indeed for that really interesting um, introduction. I think it's just sometimes good to know that there are people that you can talk to that aren't going to judge you. You know, that's really, I think that's probably one of the biggest steps when it comes to debt and insolvency. It is, it's got that awful stigma that just, we all need to kind of face up to now, don't we? Um, and it's also good to know that there's advice out there on how you can restructure your business, not necessarily have to fold it, fold it up, but actually the things that you can do to kickstart it again and, and um, redirect it so that you go back into profitability. So that's, Really, really good news in the first instance. We're also joined today by Donald Forsyth and Michael Thompson. Perhaps you could just introduce yourself briefly before we go to some questions that we've had submitted in advance. Okay, thanks, Fiona. I'm uh, Donald Forsyth. I'm a partner in Sanford Chapness, a county firm. I spend most of my time advising people who are running their own businesses and also spend a considerable amount of my time helping people buy, sell and restructure their businesses. Hi Fiona, uh, my name is Michael Thompson, I'm a Relationship Director with the Bank of Scotland um, and serve clients across Highlands and Islands area um, and it's been really interesting listening to the conversation so far today uh, and as we go through the question session hopefully we'll be able to provide a bit of clarity as to where banks come from and, and why they want to support our clients as well. So. I think we're all singing off the same hymn page, so it'll be nice and interesting to see how, how this session progresses. Well, that's good to know. Right, so I'm going to kick off with some questions, and I think, you know, 
if anybody wants to just jump in, then please do. Um, and again, if anybody's got any additional questions they want to put in the chat, please do so. And if there's anything outstanding at the end of the session, then we'll obviously um, get the answers to you after the session. Um, Margot, you've touched on this, but what would you say are the signs, like key signs for a small business that should prompt either directors or individuals to seek the advice of an insolvency practitioner or IP? Um, well, it's definitely cash flow problems and I think pressure from creditors. You know, if they're, they're unable to meet the debts as they fall due, then they are technically insolvent and then they need to be very careful about what, what steps to take next. Um, because if the, the business does, if an insolvency process does follow, um, there are risks for the directors there as far as um, being disqualified from acting in the management of a company. Um, and these are things they want to avoid. So it's good to take the advice so they're clear on what the risks are. And are there, are there organisations where businesses and individuals can seek free debt advice? Or would you advise going straight to an IP? Um, I'm probably a bit biased and would advise going to an IP, but um, there are other organisations out there, such, such as the Citizens Advice Bureau and the Local Authority Money Advisors. Who will also get free insolvency advice. Okay, does anybody else have anything to jump in at that point? There, there are um, charities available who uh, give um, insolvency advice. A lot of it, I think, is directed towards personal insolvency as opposed to, to, to businesses. I think in most instances, I would have thought it would, if, you, if you've got a business that's uh, got challenges, you probably would want to be speaking to an insolvency practitioner. I mean, in terms of the, the cost, I think Margot mentioned earlier, uh, her business is the same as ours. We're, we're always happy to have a free meeting with somebody, whether it's a face-to-face, -face, hopefully touch wood in the world when we can go back out and meet people again or over a, a Zoom or a, a Teams or a phone call or something like that, just to, to have a discussion to see kind of what um, kind of thoughts we can add or, or if there's anything that they that they want to ask us to do a, a lot of the conversations that we have are early stages with businesses where it's not kind of uh, phoning up saying oh, I can't pay the wages on Friday what do I do it's kind of I've got a concern and uh, this might happen in a month or two's time and I just want to chat about it so it's not like um, a high percentage of the businesses that either myself or my Will, will end up in a formal insolvency process or anything like that. We're, we're kind of like Donald, as you say, is let, let's uh, try and speak to people when they think there might be an issue as opposed to mm. I, I've, I've kind of run out of options. Mm. Uh, yeah. if, the, if I just come in there for agree, just to uh, echo what uh, Alan and Margo uh, said there, so, you know, even as qualified accountant, you know, if someone came to me and they were up against it, I would immediately recommend that they obtain professional advice from someone like Alan or uh, Margo. And most of the IPs that I've ever worked with are very willing to have that kind of off the record, early stage discussion at no cost. And that can, that sometimes provides the answer, can provide a lot of uh, comfort, but it is it is a specialist area. You know, my, uh, my expertise is perhaps helping people not get in that position, but once they're in that position, they absolutely, definitely should take professional advice from a insolvency practitioner. Great advice. I suppose that kind of leads us into the next question, which possibly Margot might be best placed to um, respond to. How would you suggest businesses approach creditors? Or is that something that the IP would give you some help with? Um, yeah, I think that you just need to, I, I think before you, you pick up the phone to them, you need to have a clear plan on what, you know, how, how you're going to deal with those outstanding balances. Um, so it's back to keeping that sort of cash flow, 13 week rolling cash flow that I mentioned. Um, and looking at that and seeing what you can afford, realistically afford to pay and when you can afford to pay it and not over promising when you're dealing with creditors. So um, have some figures to back up what you're, you're offering to pay them. Um, 
and just builds confidence and sticks to whatever the agreement is. And take a deep breath before you pick up the phone, I would have thought. <laughs> there, there's no doubt, um, that, as I was saying, if, if I, I think what is particularly in the current climate, and this might impact the, the kind of relatively low level of insolvencies and just the, the economy in general, creditors don't really want to, to put other businesses who they're dealing with into liquidation. And that's, I mean, the likes of the banks and Michael and the guys there have been incredibly supportive throughout this, this period that creditors are not kind of out there to get businesses in general, I don't think. But if you, if you approach them with a kind of mentality of, I'll just pay you whenever it suits me, or you've not got a proper thought through plan and the like, it, it, it is a risk to start going and, and speaking to your creditors on that, on that, basis you, you probably want to have as much as possible your plan in place before you pick up the phone which will give you the confidence as you say it allows you to take the it's still going to be a deep breath conversation um but at least if you know what you're trying to say that's going to be better than just phoning up and, and apologizing you know absolutely claire has asked could I ask when current limits on creditors presenting winding up petitions and landlords evicting tenants are going to be reinstated? Do we have any up, any ideas about that? At the moment, it's 30th of June. Um, that's the latest. Whether or not they'll extend it again to the end of September, the same as the furlough scheme, we don't know. I mean, every other extension has been within the last week when they've announced it. So um, there probably won't be any update on that until the end of June. Right, okay. Um, Michael, banks have been incredibly supportive, which has been brilliant. When should businesses or individuals approach their bank if they think they're in difficulties? Uh, I would certainly say, like the other comments, it, it's as early as possible. Um, banks typically have dynamic credit scoring going on behind the scenes, so we can start seeing trends deteriorating um, through the bank account. At an early stage, but it's it's imperative that individuals or business owners are, are engaging with the bank fully and frankly, because we all come from that same purpose where we want to help businesses and support them so that they don't progress further down that deterioration scale and bring them back to a, a good place. Um, I would also say that banks across the board um, to demonstrate that they're keen to support put treating customers fairly at the heart of everything they do and should always deliver that with an empathetic message. Circumstances change in business. That's what happens. We know that, we appreciate it, and we will try and engage with you, set up a plan, and we maybe ask for regular financial information coming through and set business plans over short and medium terms to see that recovery process come into play. We have a lot of experience. We've dealt with these things before. And together, I'm sure that we can find solutions. So sometimes if the deterioration is significant, we may call on some of our colleagues within business support units. And again, that's not something to be feared. It's all coming from that same direction. How can we help a business get back on its feet again? It's not about managing a risk. It's about helping a business. So speak to your relationship managers. Have that engagement and tell them, frankly, what's happening, what your concerns are, and you'll be surprised how banks will try and work with you to try and support that message and bring that recovery plan back before insolvency and all these other scenarios come into play. So early engagement is definitely the way forward there. Something that I've been working on over the last year well, certainly since September is mortgage holidays and obviously the banks were incredibly brilliant at giving everybody mortgage holidays back in March of last year but then once if you reached your six months of mortgage holiday then you would have to go into forbearance which then directly impacts your credit score does it not and I think that's the only piece in that puzzle that's failed in terms of support because whilst you know, we've still been in lockdown for most of the year, we've still had to pay our mortgages and certainly in small accommodation providers, many of those business premises are covered by one's own dwelling mortgage at the same time. So that's been really difficult. I mean, that's not gonna change now, is it? 
No, and it was true also in the on the commercial side as well, where we were allowing payment holidays up to six months and then exceptionally up to nine months. When you hit that 12-month trigger, it was forbearance. And those are regulations that are in place that the banks have to adhere to. So again, see if there's other alternatives or solutions that are maybe there behind the scenes other than just purely a payment holiday. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. At some point, banks also have to look at the fact that they're the creditor, they need their borrowing repaid one way or another, and just pushing things on because there'll be genuine businesses that will have difficulty and others will just want the convenience of not paying so they can build up cash reserves. And, and it's a difficult one to manage, but that's why the regulations are the way they are. But uh, again, speak to your mortgage providers, speak to the bank, explain the situation. They don't want to go down the route of repossession. It's the last resort. So there, there are alternatives there that can be used to help. So That's good to know. Yeah, that's good to know. In terms of debt consolidation, we've got a question. Do you consider debt consolidation to be a good way for businesses and individuals to repay debt? Or what other methods of managing credit and loans would you suggest? Donald, perhaps you might help us out with that. Yeah, I, th I think... Um... I think people are are generally better at managing personal debts than they are business debts. And what I mean by that, Fiona, is often see people in business using the wrong type of debt. So, you know, in a personal situation, we would use a mortgage to buy a house. We'd use a HP agreement perhaps to buy a car. We'd pay for our telephones on a pay-as-you-go basis. And you might use your overdraft if you have a, a bumpy month or two. We're all that's very clear from a personal uh, uh, situation. It's, it's equally true in business, although often in business, people seem to forget that logic and they'll get an overdraft and they'll use the overdraft to do some major improvement or buy an asset, which, which should perhaps be funded by a longer term loan. And you can often get into difficulties by having the a mismatch of the debt and, and what you're uh, spending it on. So I think debt consolidation can actually help that situation. If someone has got into a difficult situation, um, it may be partly due to, to the fact that they didn't have the appropriate type of debt for the expenditure that uh, they had uh, uh, intended. So I think debt consolidation can be useful to to reshape debt and get it in the right shape, the right structure, the right term that's um, appropriate for the business. I suppose following on from that, should businesses consider other ways of restructuring debt? What might that restructuring look like for a small business? It is a minefield for people that don't know the ins and outs of this. Uh, I think that would, uh, I think there's certainly merit in looking at that, and it depends on what kind of business they have. Um, you know, even within the area that we're, we're we're looking at in the industry, we're looking at this afternoon. There'll be many different types of businesses. To as you say, if you're in the people who are running the business from part of their own home to people who perhaps own many standalone. Uh, uh, standalone properties you know, across various various parts of the country. So we really need to look at the, the assets that are available because the, there, there are other forms of debt um, that are available for certain businesses. So if you've spent a lot of money on equipment, you might be able to refinance that and effectively put a retrospective HP agreement uh, 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 in place, um, if you're if you're owed a, a lot of money, you get like invoice discounting. So, I mean, there are a whole range of finance options available, and there's probably a greater range of finance suppliers available now than than ever before. Well, there you go, silver linings and all that. Um, Michael, going back to the kind of government policies, is there anything industry can or should be doing? to alter government policy, for example, in relation to the repayment of government-backed loans. Um, 
you know, and also, I suppose, on the same subject, could you give us a brief overview of the bounce back loans pairs you grow scheme? Because that's quite yeah. Helpful. So the the bounce back scheme um, was taken up very well last year, um, but now we're entering into that window where repayments are due to start. Um, so talking on behalf of my own organisation, but I'm sure all the other banks have a similar approach and strategy. Um, we will write out to our clients three months, two months, and one month before the repayment window starts. So for example, if your, your first repayment's on the 4th of July, you'll have already received a letter from us. Um, and that invites you to an online portal where you can self-serve and look at the um, pay-as-you-grow scheme. So specifically what that does, that will allow you to extend the term of the, the bounce back repayment period up to 10 years. That's the maximum term we can go to. And within that, if you choose not to do that, you can also look at taking capital holidays or capital and interest holidays. And you can request up to three times you can request that um, for a maximum period of six months at each time. So it's it's been a great um, method of support to a lot of small businesses um, and that ability to be able to, to flex the repayments. It doesn't get classed as a comment you made earlier as forbearance. So you've got the comfort of knowing you can change that without any impact on credit ratings, et cetera. Um, I would say though that if you've taken several payment holidays for particularly capital and interest, um, and then you come seeking further financial support from your bank or lender, then whilst there's no credit rating implication, there is the question mark about the ongoing affordability and that, that would obviously come into any sort of credit assessment. So take it where it's appropriate. It's, it's there for everyone to use. There's, it's a free self-service system to be able to put that in place. And um, yeah, you'll, you'll get communicated well in advance to allow you to start looking at extending the terms. The, the CBIL scheme is now formally closed. Um, there's still applications getting processed and, and we'll see that finish over the next couple of months. And there's now the recovery loan scheme available, which is more a security driven solution that's been made available um, for those that don't have security, but it's a six year loan repayment period potentially business as usual funding, 10, 15 year commercial money, um, maybe more appropriate than actually using a government scheme. So again, it's, it's a case of speaking to your bank, finding out what options are available. And, uh, there's certainly an appetite to provide more financial support to, to good quality, viable businesses. So uh, engage where you can. And don't panic when you get the first letter through the letterbox to say that don't panic at all no it, it really is it's a uh, another offer of support it's it's no more than that and uh you know that that's been very true of of the the governments and the banks you know they're, they're keen to help and support because we're we're wanting to keep everything afloat till we get to that window where we can see normal trade resume but it's getting through that period there is instruments there to to lean on so fantastic thank you John put a comment in the chat. Have a look at the R&D tax credits if you haven't already done so. Possibly some cash to be had back from HMRC. Yeah, well, that does seem like an extraordinary thing, John. Um, can somebody just um, give us an overview of what exactly are R&D tax credits? Yeah, I can probably uh, fill that gap, Fiona. So R&D tax credits, a special, a special tax break so if your business is involved in research and development, um, so if your business spends a thousand pounds on research and development that qualifies under the research and, develop, research and uh, development uh, tax scheme, instead of getting a tax deduction for a thousand pounds, if you're an SME, you can get a, a tax deduction of 2,300 pounds. You get an extra 130% tax deduction. Um, so that can significantly reduce your tax bills. Um, if you do it retrospectively, the revenue will send you a check for the additional tax that you've paid. And in certain schemes, you can actually cash in the um, R&D credits um, if, if you haven't made uh, profits and receive a lower amount of 
cash from HMRC. So very well worth uh, looking at. It's not just for businesses that employ people in uh, white coats. Um, I've been involved in research and development tax credits for um, businesses in uh, food and drink and um, uh, not in the kind of particularly advanced end of food and drink, people dealing with basic commodities, fish, vegetables, you know, I've seen successful R&D tax claims. So well worth looking at. If you speak to someone about R&D tax claims, um, they should quite quickly be able to figure out whether your business is likely to qualify. Again, the kind of discussion that you can have an informal discussion with your uh, accountant um, should be able to establish if you're likely to qualify or not. That is very helpful advice indeed. Um, Alan, is there anything industry, she says, giving herself another job, um, can be doing going forward to monitor the potential to lose businesses through insolvency? I think it's it's probably difficult for an industry to look at a, a sector in totality and say, oh, there, there's the, there's an individual business that, that might be subject to insolvency. It's, it's really kind of, I think, through regular engagement with the individual businesses and their advisors and, um, as you say, lenders and, and, and kind of relevant people in the industry, the likes of John, I suppose, and yourself, is kind of having that open discussion as to, as to where people are at with their, with their individual business. Because it's not to say that um, two businesses that operate in the same sector and seem similar from the outside, one might be doing well and one might not for, for whatever reasons, kind of internal or market driven or otherwise. So it, it's a difficult one. I, I think the, the problem is I kind of alluded to in the, in the, the kind of opening gambit is that there, there will always unfortunately be some business failures and, and, and businesses shouldn't just continue just regardless. But um, I think it, it's, it goes back to just the key warning signs, any, any kind of downturn in trading or, or, or cash challenges that people have got to, um, to pick up the phone. And, and, and as much as can be done to, to remove the barriers to successful trade as well. And I know John in particular has done a, a lot of that with the, some of the, the stuff on the, the food and drink and the, the EU challenges with Brexit and the like. So it, it's it's really those things is kind of looking out, businesses looking out for each other and mm -hmm. as, as as much as we can do to, to try and limit the barriers to, to successful trading. Joanna, if I come in with, with one yeah. point there. I think, I think a telltale sign, you know, if if one of your customers starts to pay you, you know, round some amounts instead of settling particular invoices, um, if they just start to send you five hundred pounds or thousand pounds, it's often a sign that they're struggling to pay. So, you know, say if if a customer of mine owes me money for seven different invoices. And then, but they just send me lumps of two hundred and fifty pounds. They send me like round lump sums of money. It's often a sign that that's all they can afford to pay. So it, it can be quite a good early warning uh, system on an individual customer uh, level. If you start to see your customer behaving like that, worthwhile picking up the phone and asking them why they're paying round sum amounts and not clearing off whole invoices. So you could actually be doing them a little bit of a favor if you- You could be. Prompted them like yeah. that, actually. Um, how can trade representatives, Donald, I think this is probably one for you again. How can trade representatives assist businesses with debt going forward? Where should industry be signposting businesses for debt management, apart from telling them to watch this? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I, I suppose we. I feel we've probably covered most of that already. So for for trade bodies, or John uh, mentioned uh, earlier that uh, Michael and I are both involved with the Institute of Directors. Um, so I, I think trade bodies, membership bodies, um, 
whilst trade boys in particular may have an insight to, to issues in their particular industry, I think advising people to have early discussions with their banks, accountants, whether IP professional is, is the, uh, the best advice that they can give and, and would really emphasize the benefit of doing that early. Um, as Alan said earlier, if someone phones them up and says, I can't pay my wages on Friday, there's not a lot you can do to help in that situation. But if, if they have a discussion with them and saying, yeah, I'm concerned the cash flow in my business is really tightening and it looks as if we you know, might be hitting the buffers in the next uh, few months, then that leaves more time for action to be taken. Yeah, I, yeah. I, it's a really difficult subject, isn't it? Let's face it. Margot, I think the answer is probably yes. Do you think there should be less stigma for the management of debt? How can we as industry representatives work with debt and IPs to cut through that sort of silence surrounding it and, and make it more approachable? Yeah, it's an, another difficult question, I think. I mean, there definitely should be less stigma, and I think as I touched on in my opening talk, you know, the thing about the stigma is it seems to be, it seems to prevent people from seeking that, that help and that advice um, when they get into debt, but there doesn't seem to be any stigma with borrowing money or, you know, um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Um, it's a I really again, it's, Yeah, I think, again, it's just um, seeking advice early and encouraging people to do that. Um, Donald's got some thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think, um, I think, I mean, clearly, if someone is very exercised and they have debts and they have cash flow problems, that's not a good place to be and they should seek help. But I don't think we should think of debt uh, as a negative thing. Uh, we use debt in our, most of us use debt in our personal lives to buy a house or buy a car. So it improves our lives, it's a positive thing. It enables us to own a home sooner or own a car. Or, or, and in, in the same way, um, the correct use of debt will help a business grow faster the correct use of debt can improve a business's profitability. So if you pardon the pun, you know, debt is a, a four-letter word, but it, it needn't be a four-letter word in that expletive uh, sense. Debt isn't, isn't all bad. That's a really nice concept, and I think one that will be very welcome for a lot of people. Is there anything else you, I'm conscious of time, is there anything else that you think would be important to raise at this point? Have we missed anything? I think one thing that has been mentioned but probably worth just kind of passing on again is somebody was talking about the, the quality of, of management information and kind of good financial reporting, like have a cash flow forecast. I think um, it was maybe Donald that said that people seem to be very good in their personal life at knowing exactly or roughly at least what their, in, their income and outgoings are, what the mortgage level they can afford. So if you can do that in your personal life, why not have it in your business? <laughs> it's, it makes total mm -hmm. sense to allow you to plan. Um, it'll, it would certainly make conversations with Michael and his colleagues a lot easier if there's quality MI to, to look at. And, and having a plan, I think is, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. I think what we're talking about here today is businesses that have kind of got, got some some real challenges and are looking at difficulties. But beyond that, it's, it's a, a kind of wider plan is where is the business going? What do people want to achieve with it? Is it something they would like to build up and sell? Is it something to pass on to their children? Is it a lifestyle business that they're going to be sticking with for the next 5, 10, 15 years. All, all these things kind of tie into just, just, just good controls around the business. And it's not to say that a business with good controls can't get into difficulties because ultimately if, if something happens to your biggest customer or like COVID where the market disappears and, and nobody's allowed to travel and stay in a hotel or, or accommodation, then that there, that's very difficult to deal with. But at least if you've got the quality controls around it, I think you've got much more chance of being able to to preserve your business and the value if, if it's if it's well controlled in the first instance, you know. Absolutely. 
Has anybody else got anything to add? I think, Fiona, I'll just refer to what you said in your opening remarks about the importance of planning, that planning is crucial and would echo everything that Alan said there about having good management information. I, I think too many business owners understand their profit and loss account, but they don't understand their balance sheet. They, they, they focus on, on their profitability and they don't look sufficiently at their debt, their activity levels, their liquidity. And you need good management information to look at all of these areas. And again, as Alan said, having that won't guarantee that you don't get into trouble, but it should probably give you more advance warning that you might get into trouble. Thank you. John, perhaps I could pass over to you to just make a final few comments. Yeah, yeah sure. No, thanks. Really interesting. And um, my kind of takeaway there is that the um, light bulb moment is how people look at their home finances and their business finances in polar opposites very often and with not the same clarity. So, uh, no, it's been really good, really informative. You know, it's the same message throughout here, guys. So I would just say to everybody watching now and, and afterwards is uh, take, hold, take heed, uh, management information. You know, information is power. Speed is your friend. Absolutely. And I, I, I hope that this has given people food for thought. You know, don't spend sleepless nights worrying. Maybe it's time to start having conversations before things get critical. And there are people on this call today that can help you with whatever you need to be helped with. The ASSC and the Highland Business Partnership are here for you, whatever happens. Don't be worried about sharing. If you don't know who to turn to, we can probably help. There's usually a way forwards even if that doesn't necessarily look like anything that you thought it would look like. So I think we've got to keep harnessing the positivity. It's, it's not over till it's over. And before I say goodbye, um, I just want to wish everybody all the best of luck with reopening next week, if you can open next week. And thanks again so much to our panel and all of you for joining us today. Good luck and bye-bye. Thank you. Right. Thanks, thanks everyone. Cheers.